Welcome in. It is another edition of Fifth Avenue Faceoff. I'm Chris Mack at 93.7 The Fan and The Fan Morning Show. Thank you for downloading and listening inside your Odyssey app, A-U-D-A-C-Y, or wherever you get your podcasts. iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, however you get it, we appreciate you listening. Uh, YouTube, you can watch the show there. Uh Uh-huh, sure can. YouTube.com slash 93.7 The Fan. You go there and you get all of, if you click on that little notification bell there, you'll get uh, notifications every time there's a new video uploaded to the 93.7 The Fan channel. That includes, obviously, new episodes of Fifth Avenue Faceoff, including this one, which you're watching right now or listening. Uh, brand new book out. It's not brand, I guess it's been out for a few months. Unfiltered by Matthew Barnaby. You remember Matthew Barnaby as a Pittsburgh Penguin for a few years, but he had a 15-year NHL career that spanned across seasons in Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Tampa, New York with the Rangers, Colorado, Dallas, uh, and started out as just a kid growing up uh, on the south side of Ottawa, Uh, not growing up in the best circumstances. Uh, I'm not going to give it all away. Uh, That's why you go out and get the book. Uh, But growing up in difficult circumstances and making the most of the skill that he had in order to get through juniors and eventually drafted by the Buffalo Sabres and making a career of it, well, via the the, the primary skill of his, which was being a pest. Uh, he was fantastic at that. In a day and age where pests still had to answer for their actions, Barnaby had to answer for them a lot. It's what led to the end of his career when he was in Dallas, uh, and was being asked to take on much bigger, much larger humans and took maybe one punch or two punches too many and ended up having to hang up the skates. He works for Bet99 Sportsbook now and also, like I said, has the new book out. Um, it, we're lucky enough to have him for a couple minutes during the Stanley Cup playoffs, no less. Here he is, Matthew Barnaby. And here he is, the one, the only, Matthew Barnaby, 15-year NHL veteran, former Pittsburgh Penguin. Uh, We're probably partial uh, to his years here in Pittsburgh rather than any others during his career, but he had great ones certainly in Buffalo, Tampa, New York, Colorado, and Dallas. He's got a new book out. It's called Unfiltered. Uh, It is fantastic. Highly recommended for all hockey fans, especially those who were fans of Matthew, whether it was during his time here in Pittsburgh or anywhere else around the league. Thanks for taking the time today, Matthew. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Keep up the awesome work. I listen to you. And uh, yeah, Pittsburgh was a fun spot, man. It was, uh, it was a great time. I, I really, it was, it was a sad day when I, when I, when I had to leave. Um, But I I look back at those three years there and the memories that I made and, and the friends that I made and certainly Playing in front of the the Pittsburgh faithful was uh, something I'll never forget. Well, yeah, and you survived the rats at the old igloo, so you get points for that. Now they got this beautiful new building, man. You 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 managed to get through there in one piece. That that's bullshit. I probably <laughs> when I, as, as as I do get a little bit older, I'm sure I'll have some asbestos stuck <laughs> yeah. in my lungs from from the, it was you, cool, right? um, but man, yeah, it was old. It's these. The, Silver spooned athletes now, man, they have chefs and shit. This I know, it's just not fair. <laughs> they get every, they get it with their 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 asses wiped at every turn. Matthew, by the way, kids, this is an earmuffs edition of Fifth Avenue Face Off. Just be prepared, okay? It's got that little E next to it for a reason. Um, so let me, I, 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 I want to rewind. I want to start back at like the beginning of the book because, like I told you before we hit record, I'm about halfway through. I'm through the part of. Uh, where we get to the end of your, the unfortunate end of your career. Um, but let's, let's rewind all the way back to little 10 year old, eight, nine, 10 year old Matthew in, in South Ottawa. Um, you get to go in Marty McFly's time machine, his 1983 DeLorean back to that time and give yourself one piece of advice after all the years. What would it be? Wow. Um, God, I, I, I don't think I would change much to where I was as a kid. I, I probably would have said focus on my schoolwork a little bit more because I put all my eggs in one basket. I was an athlete, um, played baseball, played soccer, uh, played all those at high levels, obviously played hockey. But, you know, I, I as a young kid, I just wanted to be a hockey player. That That's all that mattered, even though I was good at other sports. 
and I really committed at a young age to, to, to really doing that. I didn't have much of a, a childhood in the fact that, you know, high school and, and going to parties, um, as I got older, I, I really focused on hockey. So I wouldn't change that much. Um, I would say even work on skating a little bit more. I, I think with, with everything, you know, skill work and, and skating is, is paramount to having success in, in hockey, whether it be the NCAA level or the NHL level. But, you know, I was a pretty dedicated kid to, to my craft. And I'm very fortunate that it all worked out because I didn't have a plan B. I came from very little money. And uh, my plan A was to play hockey. My plan B was to play hockey. My plan C <laughs> was to play hockey. So fortunately uh, for myself, it all worked out. Well, that's what makes the story, especially of you pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, I think such a good one, Matthew, is you you, you end up finding your way to juniors, right? And you you, you discover, hey, I, I've got to work more on my skating ability. Well, you dive headlong into power skating classes that are available. I've got to learn how to be the toughest guy on the ice some nights. And so you work on getting tougher and, you know, maybe polishing up your knuckles a little bit. And then you go off to play juniors, and it's in Quebec, so you've got to learn to speak French as well. Um, just when you look back on that time period of your your mid to late teens and going off to play juniors, um, what was the toughest part of it for you? Yeah, you know what? It's it's funny. In in writing the book, uh, my 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 wife really went through, and she's the one that came up with the really the start of the book and how it how it came to fruition because. You know, I, I left there. I was the last overall pick in, in junior. And obviously when you're the 20th rounder, 23rd rounder, whatever it is, you're not expected to make the team. And I was fortunate that all the stars aligned. I was in an expansion team and uh, going there, you know, I was a talented kid. I was like everyone that plays. I, I was I was pretty talented growing up and I didn't grow till I was about 17, but I was still still very light and, and underdeveloped um, for a 17 year old weight wise. And, you know, when I first showed up there, you know, just just trying to find my way. And I remember just my my mom and brother wanting to come up and, and support and, and check it all out. And I just told them not to come because I I wasn't I wasn't not that I wasn't talented enough. I wasn't ready physically to compete against 18, 19, 20 year olds. And that's where I was. And my brother just said, stand out. He didn't say to fight. And. Uh, that was the defining moment. I think everyone in life has a defining moment, work-wise, relationship-wise, whatever it may be. And that was my defining moment. I just chose to essentially become a different person. And I'm completely different off the ice than I am from on the ice. Everyone knows me as this crazy bastard on the ice. And <laughs> I would flip a switch. I'd, I'd literally go from being, you know, asking people about their their kids and, and that when I got into the NHL to getting on the ice and not even knowing who I was. And it was just it wasn't pretending it was just adopting a different personality, knowing that that's what made me successful. So I, I, I really say the, the hardest part was becoming a different player when you are so accustomed to being a certain player. Now I'm antagonistic and I love needling people and I love people needling me. That's, that's how I pick my friends. Like that's, that, I, I love that interaction. If you're going to be passive and, and kiss my ass and cause I played in the NHL, you're not going to be my friend. That's, that's, I love my, my friends tease me and treat me as one of their own, one of their, one of their coworkers, but hands down the most difficult thing, because this is 30 years ago, over 30 years ago. And we're talking late eighties, early nineties. I was the only English speaking person in Quebec city, yeah. like the only English speaking person. So to go to a new place and not have a car, I, I went there on a gray, Greyhound bus with a bag uh, my hockey bag, my stick, and literally that was it. And I, I never came home, really. I, I played there for three years, was drafted, and uh, learning a new language was probably the most difficult thing. Yeah, I, I mean, th I can't imagine being thrown into it headlong like that. I mean, we see like we see guys come over from Russia now, and credit to a guy like uh, Evgeny Malkin, for example. First couple of years, used the translator, and then eventually just kind of dove headlong into the English language despite his reservations. But... I can't imagine going to a place like Quebec as a teenager and yeah. you're trying to, and you're trying to do everything you can on the ice every night to, to hold on to, to anything you may have at that level. But now you got to do it. You got people insulting you in French. I don't even, I don't even know how to, I'm barely, 
You talk about chirping people. I can barely do it in English uh, 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 that quickly, let alone in French. Insult me in French, Matthew. What, if you could say something to me in French, say something. What would you tell me? C'est un nested manger de merde qui mange les trop de cul. What? Oh, I have no idea what the hell you just said. What'd you call me? You're an absolute piece of shit that eats. <laughs> I love it. I, I'm going to rewind that part so I can learn how to say it. Yeah, you got to roll the R's. And I always said it. <laughs> I, I, I learned French for two reasons. To get laid. Yeah. I was 17, 18, 19 years old. <laughs> and to eat. And I didn't eat very well for the first three years. Well, as long as it worked on one hand, I guess you could survive, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> let, let me let me pivot that and, and, and the idea of juniors and, um, you know, some kids, you mentioned schooling, some kids come from Canada down to, to the States to go to college now to play in the States. We just saw the frozen four a couple weeks ago for just a minute. Let's, let's get serious about the culture in juniors and college. Some of the stories you, you tell in the book, I'll be honest. are like, wow. You know, I, I look, I, I went to, to Penn state university. I didn't play hockey there, but uh, you know, I was in enough frat houses to know what hazing was all about. <laughs> um, some of the stories you tell, you know, there's innocent hazing. Some of the stuff we think about that you go, ah, oh, okay, yeah, all right, no big deal. Uh, and then there's some of the stuff that we know has happened. Um, you know, you see Hockey Canada going through everything it's gone through the last year or so. Has the culture at the junior and college level uh, improved enough over the last few years uh, that people can feel better about sending their, you know, 16, 17-year-old kid off to a billet family somewhere uh, far away from home? And trying to launch their career? First of all, we we were a we were. We 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 were Penn State. My my son was committed to Penn State to play hockey. Unfortunately, he didn't he didn't realize that Penn State is actually a school and you have to do schoolwork. <laughs> so, well, uh, and, I you know what? I got through it, Matthew. It, it took me four and a half years, but I might be case in point for why you don't necessarily need to be the smartest guy in the world to get through Penn State. But what a place, man. We, yes. <laughs> we went there on the recruiting trip and what a place it's it's uh he plays in the east coast league now and uh man did he mess out because what a what a place we went there and uh we were supposed to go to north dakota and all these other places i'm getting off topic but what no, a place okay. we, were, we were almost there we were almost we are but we were just we were and we've adopted <laughs> uh penn state as our our american school as it. for as for hazing uh having having kids and I, that's for any kid out there that's in sports and, and you're sending them off to junior or uh, even the collegiate level. Cause it's happened on both levels, but I'd say Canadian junior hockey was much more apt to, to crucify you and embarrass you and degrade you. And late eighties, there was no social media. And I think social media plays a big, big part in that into being able, you know, there's cyber bullying, but you're able to right. get your story out there mm -hmm. and, you know, I went through some disgusting stuff, man. Like, and for those people listening, you know, earmuffs. Yeah. Like I was put with four guys around a piece of bread and asked to jerk off on it. The last guy was supposed to eat it. I was like, fuck this. I'm not, it's, it's, I love hockey. I want to play hockey, uh, but you're not going to degrade me like that. And I went to the coaches and didn't tell them what happened, but I just said, when we get on the ice, there's going to be some fights. And I was fortunate we were on a, on an expansion team where we had as many rookies as we did veterans. And literally it was a, it was a brawl on the ice. So, wow. you know, running naked through the city, um, sticking an apple in our ass or trying to do it, like just all that kind of shit. Uh, glad it's gone. And that's the difference between junior to the AHL to the NHL. Uh, and even the NFL, you can, you can say, even though there's not minor leagues essentially, but the difference between minor and, and, and not pro to being pro when you make a team or, or you get a job, it's about inclusiveness. You know, you're, it's supposed to be the happiest day of your life when you make a team and, you know, have them pick up a dinner, have them do something, have them do something funny. I'm all right. for that and, and joking around, but it's about inclusiveness and you, you just made it. You don't, you don't want the best day in your life to be the worst experience of your life. And right, right. when I was assistant captain the next year, it was completely off. You know, we did tricycle races and yeah, we drank with them, but we didn't get them drunk where they were puking all over themselves and risking death. And yeah. that's something I always carried with me from my first year, as bad as an experience it was for myself and, and for those other guys, 
we learned something and we were able to inflict change if it might be from any other team that I ever played on. Well, let me turn towards what we're seeing today in the NHL. And I don't mean off the ice. I mean on the ice, especially in the first round. Um, First few games of the first round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. We're seeing big hits. This is the time of year where that that physicality starts to ramp up again. We see Dumbo. We see bunting. We see guys getting caught in the tracks. Um, That is a part of the game that I think a lot of us who have played it, and especially you playing it at a high level for a long time, I think – value to an extent right it's got to be a collision sport uh not just a contact sport um has it become too sterilized from from what it was at your peak in your prime or is it better this way you know if it had been this way 20 25 years ago would we have seen a longer more productive career for maybe an example in eric lindros you know um do, do you is it still physical enough for you it, it is physical enough for me. Hey, listen, when I played, it was archaic. And you little, literally shit your pants going into some buildings. And, like, I was never afraid to fight. But to say I was nervous going into Philadelphia, knowing you had to fight Brashear and Rick Tockett and uh, Craig Berube in one night, you might have to fight all three or going into Toronto and, and fighting Domi and, and Prober, whoever it may be. Those days are done. And thankfully, they're done. Do I like a good fight once in a while? Absolutely. I, I, I still think there is a place in the game, but not where there's the staged fights and the expectation. Uh, having said that, I do miss some of the rivalries that come with that and the fan engagement in, in all of that. But we've learned so much about the brain. We've learned so much about, you know, what is clean, what is dirty, and, and what's acceptable. I take the Dumba hit. That's a, that's a clean hit. That's a clean hit. Pavelski wasn't ready to get hit and the woke world is all up in arms because it happened to their player. If you're from Dallas and you know, you don't want to see guys get hurt, but yes, certainly I think we're in a better spot. The game's in a better spot. Imagine Mario Lemieux playing now, not being able to get hooked. Oh my God. All of that. I mean, Yager, imagine the points that they'd put up. Listen, Connor McDavid is on a, on a different level, Mm -hmm. but certainly we're in a better spot. And I, I think when you get to playoffs, is there nights during the regular season might be on a Tuesday night where Pittsburgh's playing Columbus and, and there's not the fights and there's not the physical element might get a little boring. Yeah, you could have that. Listen, I've watched these games in the playoffs. It's physical and I'm not missing the fighting in, in the playoffs. It's just great, great hockey. The only thing I miss is maybe that Pittsburgh Penguins were playing. Yes, good point, and I want to ask you about that in a couple minutes. Um, could you be as effective in today's game as you were back in the day? Because when I like, and this is comparison. I'm not the first person to make this comparison, I'm sure, but I see a guy like Tom Wilson, for example, in Washington. Classic example, much like you were. Of damn it, I hate that guy, but if he were on my team, I would love that guy. Um, and but but there's there were a, I don't want to say a lot of guys like that back in the day, but there were certainly more of you. There's not many examples of that now. I I think I'd be way more effective, way, way way more effective because I always felt a responsibility. Listen, my whole goal in every game was to draw penalties, get them pissed off at me, come after me, slash me, punch me, whatever it is. We'll score on the power play and win the game. It's all about winning the game. But I always felt an obligation at some point. It didn't have to be in that game. It didn't have to be at that moment. It had to be the next game. But at some point, if Stu Grimson or Bob Probert, whoever it was, I felt the obligation to have to fight. Now you don't have that obligation. Mm-mm. Now, and if you ran your mouth back then, or you did the things that I did, and listen, I deserve the beatings that I got. I deserve this. Every slash that I took, I deserved because I said some nasty, nasty things to some people. And the way that I acted, I deserved it. But it was all about winning. You this- didn't have a choice some nights. They just jumped you. Yeah. Well, they, the game got four two with two minutes left. You're getting jumped. You might get jumped by four guys. Now you can run your mouth. Now you can stick guys. Now you can act like a rat, and you don't have to do anything about it. And listen, there's there's no one tough on the other team. You take away Ryan Reeves. Mm-hmm. You take away the I don't even know the kid's name from Colorado. You take away Tom Wilson. Who 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 are you afraid of? Like who yeah, who's the- get me? 
There's no fear of the, there's not the same fear of retribution as there once was. Is there, is there anybody who you watch today and you're like, man, that guy, that guy probably just needs a good ass kicking. And I think maybe he'd be set off on the right course. Well, you, you look at Brad Marchand. Like, mm, he's, yes. He's the epitome of a pest. And there's no one that could ever do it better because not only does he draw the penalty, not only does he piss you off, not only do you want to punch him in the face, but he's also the guy in the power play scoring. Like, right. he, he's got it all. Like, he's got it absolutely all. So uh, he's in the perfect position. He can act like a rat, do whatever he wants, not respond, and he's on the power play. Man, uh, you you talked about it in the book. And again, it's Matthew Barnaby Unfiltered is the book. I'll hold it up to the, the, so everybody on YouTube can see it again. Great book. Got it on Amazon. It's fantastic. Um, you talk about the difference in dynamics from team to team. Um, and I, I guess from room to room, right? Um, so let's start with just the idea of each locker room and the the the, the specific ecosystem within each room. Um, how fragile is it? Because the way you talk about the way things turned in Buffalo for you at the end, for example, when Ted Nolan was pushed out and Lindy Ruff came in and John Muckler may not have been the 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 biggest fan of of Ted Nolan, but it, you know you it, you could feel it in the room, right? You you went other places. You could feel like the room was split on a GM and a coach's side, or it was split into different factions. Um, how fragile is that? And do you think it's still that way today? I, I don't think it's as bad, but certainly when when teams, you know, a, a favorite guy gets traded or or a coach gets let go that everyone likes, I, I, I think there can be that dissension. Um, ours was very unique. Ours was very unique because we had a lot of young guys that Ted Nolan really gave a chance to and really believed in us, and we had success. And it wasn't like we were a team that missed the playoffs and they fired their coach or their GM. We won the Northeast division. Like we, we were on top. We didn't right. win a Stanley Cup and we weren't ready to win a Stanley cup, but he won we, the Jack Adams that year. Didn't he? He won the Jack Adams and he, and he got let go and he didn't get let go. He, he was offered a one-year contract, which he turned oh, down. Low balled. Like yeah. A normal human being would do. So that was a very, very unique situation. Listen, there's always going to be a little dissension. You have, you know, 25 different guys that come from different backgrounds that are different personalities. Um, you're not always going to get along, but our team was, once we got on the ice, even though we didn't like maybe or everyone within that room or respect their opinion on what was going on, we gave it our all. I didn't like Dominic Hasek, but Dominic Hasek, I can sit here and say, is the best goaltender that ever played the game. And no one will ever talk me out of that. Would I go for a beer or, or dinner with him? No, no, he's a piece of shit guy. But he's a hell of a goalie. So it's not like it was there and it was a very unique situation. Uh, but certainly there's things that happen in a locker room that no one ever hears about. And a lot of those guys get traded or they find a way around it uh, or find a way to work within it. I don't want to give too much away because I want people to go out and buy the book, obviously, and, and read about how things went down with Hashik at the end of your time in Buffalo. And just the way you, the, the, you outlined it there. Great goaltender, terrible guy. Um, how many... <laughs> Does that happen more often than we're we're led to believe as hockey fans that a, a room's got a guy who's maybe hanging on to his job or hanging on to his role simply because he's too good to get rid of, even though he's a giant asshole? It, it, it happens. Listen, I played on seven teams, 15 years, what, 700, 800 guys. I played with seven or eight what I consider to be bad guys. Now, maybe they considered me to be a bad guy, but like, not great teammates. They were me, me, me. Um, listen, you if you're an average player or a bad player or a, even a good player and you're a bad guy, you're not going to last long. You're, you're not going to last long. You're not going to hang on. If you're a Hall of Famer and you're not a great guy, you're going to hang on. It's, yeah. it's a, like they Dominic Hasek can do. If Dominic Hasek was an average goaltender, he would have been out of the league. But he literally stole games and gave us a chance to win. And, you know, his, his numbers speak for, for themselves. Um, you're, you're much more apt to, to last in the league as a bad guy or not a great team guy uh, as a great player, as opposed to the latter. You, uh, I mean, the, the chapter about your time playing for Ted Nolan, I mean, reads like 
a non-erotic love letter. And I'm, I'm only half joking here. Like you love that guy and you would have played for him forever uh, because he believed in you guys as people and as players. Um, when you watch Mike Sullivan and the way he handles himself behind the bench, I know it's hard to get a read cause you're not in the room. Yeah. Um, but would you, w- would you like playing for a guy like Mike, Mike Sullivan, you think? A- absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, y- there's two different aspects. There's there's the hockey player and 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 the person side and the people side. And guys have families. Um, Ted Nolan treated me and everyone else and my family and the way he treated the people that worked at the rink. And you can see that it's just genuine and organic. It, it wasn't it wasn't pretend. Mike Sullivan's one of those guys. You know, you have a hockey side. You have to you have to produce. You, you're not going to keep a crappy hockey player because he's a great guy. You're not going to keep a crappy coach because he's a great guy. But Mike Sullivan's one, and and he, he's he's a, he's a player's coach. Players want to play for him. He's not. Listen, when things go bad and, and you're Mike Sullivan, you're not thinking, oh, fire him, fire him. Now there's going to come a day where he's probably going to get fired. That's just the reality of this business. And once the big three retired, there might be some lean years, and it might be time to move in a different direction. That's 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 not a conversation for today, yeah. but you look at a guy like Sutter in Calgary Ugh. and I know I'm off the ice. He's the nicest guy in the world. Is he a guy that I'd want to play for? Listen, he'd probably like my style and like me, but if I'm a star player, like Jonathan Huberto, that's there right. now, Mackenzie Weger and Nazem Kadri, all these guys, listen, he's going to throw players under the bus and the way that he treats you at the rink and in the media that's a guy that you're not going to go to bat for. So in a long winded way of answering it, yes, Sullivan is a guy that players want to play for. When you were here, let's rewind back to the the late nineties, early two thousands. It seems like it was so much longer, by the way, as someone who was in college then um, and watching you play every night, it, it, feel, it feels like that was like four or five years in my memory. I don't know. It, Cause it was so much fun watching you and that team maybe. Um, but compare your time in Pittsburgh. You started down this road a little bit earlier. Compare your time in Pittsburgh as to your time in Buffalo, Tampa, New York, Denver, Dallas. Um, Just what was it like being in that room with all those checks and uh, those great players? Yeah, and er everyone asked me, what's your favorite place? And listen, I I always revert to Buffalo because I was 19 years old when I went there. And I, I, you know, my family started there. My kids were born there. I played, I played the longest tenor of my career in seven years there and I was part of the organization for about eight and a half so you know I was very naive and I was I was just a kid having fun just just loving life but you know Pittsburgh was awesome you know we made the playoffs every year the team got along so well and for you know everyone always asked me you know you had a lot of Czechs and a lot of Russians and uh, wow we had great guys like Yaramir Yager was just a just a fun guy to come to the rink. He loved hockey. He loved being around the rink. Martin Straka, Robert Lang, um, Alexei Kovalev. You know, he, he's not the, he, he's not a guy you're going to hang away, ha- hang away from the rink with. Right. But he was a great dude. He was, he was a great dude. No one, no one didn't get along at the rink. The, the problem we had there was, I would say, coaching in general. We had four coaches, I think, in three years. Yeah. You know, I, I, Kevin Constantine, I absolutely hated. One of the smartest hockey guys I've ever seen, but it goes back to coaching, treated people like shit. And he's a very smart hockey coach. Uh, Ivan Holinka, great dude, couldn't speak English. That's that's that that that, 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 that. So, a little bit of an obstacle when half your bench is speaking English. And I love Craig Patrick, and I probably would have played there, I don't know, three, four, five, six, maybe finished my career there if a coach like Ivan wasn't there, but great guy, God rest his soul. He passed away in a car accident years ago, but great guy. I don't hold any animosity. He just didn't appreciate the way that I played. And I knew to make more money and to, to keep my career going, I had to leave. And Craig was awesome. And then I had Herb Brooks, God rest his soul. Just a, a great guy that, that came in and kind of was thrown into the fire. Um, You know, he, his his reputation precedes himself. He's always going to be a legend in the game of hockey. Uh, I absolutely loved him. He loved me. Uh, but it was just, you know, we had a different coach every single year, a different philosophy, a different system. And, and that was tough. But, man, my memories of Pittsburgh, like I said, the people and uh, 
and just the players. The 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 locker room was awesome. Your story about and, and there's another book tease, but your story about going out for lunch and getting a beer with with her Brooks the one day is just I mean that that that's if you told me nothing else about your time in Pittsburgh playing under her Brooks that story that little story would be enough to tell me okay he he's just as good as everybody made him out to be or as everybody said he was yeah yeah he I I, I got a concussion the night before in Colorado and he listen I talk about a player's coach he 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 went right after the reporter that called said I was diving and I think it was Jack Kelly or Jack Kelly. Uh, what, what, it was Kelly, but I can't remember his first name. And we were playing in Nashville the next night. And he, he just <laughs> rang me up and four o'clock. Barney, what, what are you, what are you doing? I was like, I oh, just hang in my room, just getting ready to go to the game in a couple hours. He's like, let's go down for a beer. Now <laughs> I have a concussion. <laughs> I'm like, sure. Herb, let's, let's. Yeah. Herb. Why not? <laughs> and here, you know, before social media, but here, Here's me and a legendary coach and just a right. great guy who's suspended for the game now, having three or four beers, and then we walk over to the rink and watch the game together. Just awesome. That's old school hockey, man. That that is just perfect. Um, so you mentioned this year's Pens. It's weird. First time in 17 years. I was telling someone before. Um, it, it's I've told a couple people this. I wasn't even married the last time this team wasn't in the playoffs, man. I, I didn't have kids. I was. I was barely a, a, an adult myself. I'm not used to this. Hockey fans are not used to this. Pittsburghers are not used to this. So, look, you watch a ton of hockey. What was the problem with this year's team as you saw it? Is, sim- is it simple? Is it multi-layered? Was it just the GM? When you look at it, what does Matthew Barnaby see with this year's Penguins team? Yeah, because Pittsburgh people now have to wait for the NFL draft next Thursday to see who they're going to get, which is huge. Are they going to get a wide receiver for Kenny Pickett? I think they do, but that's a story that we could talk Ooh, about. Yeah. Um, and, and then you have to go watch the Pirates, which is even more depressing, you know, <laughs> watching a $20 million payroll. So uh, I, I didn't watch a ton of Pittsburgh games uh, this year. Once I'm in football season, I'm, I'm locked and loaded. I work for a gambling company up here. So, um, I'm locked and loaded in in football, but I do, do watch hockey. I'd say the inconsistency in goaltending, um, you know, and, and you're, they're, they're in a precarious position right now because you have three stars in, in Latang, Crosby and Malkin that still are at a high level of play and you're, and, and they're chasing, right? They, you never want to rebuild when you're when you have those guys. Crosby's going to be a penguin for life. The other two, I'm not sure how it all all plays out, but you're in a precarious position of of chasing and and trying to re to to be a contender every single year while losing draft picks. And I, I think that that comes back to to hurt you. But if I had to look at them why they didn't make the playoffs, I would just say inconsistency in goaltending, not knowing what you're going to get every single night. Can they win another cup with these three leading the charge? I'm going to say no. Wow. I'm I'm going to say no. I, I as as high they are up on there, you still need a goaltender. If they can get that, um, listen, those guys can play at the level where they can win a cup. I just don't know if you can support them with enough talent around them to win a cup. Good call. Uh, you mentioned the the work you do with Bet Ninety Nine Sportsbook. What's uh What's Matthew Barnaby's favorite bet these days? What's wor- What's the best angle working for you? Uh, it, wh- whether it's Stanley Cup playoffs or otherwise. Yeah, like I, I don't bet a ton of hockey during the regular season. It's just so hard. It's a one goal league, three two right. three, and to get any odds, you got to go puck line. Don't do that, people. Don't do it. <laughs> don't lay the puck line. It's uh, the best team in the league. Let's just say it's Colorado playing Columbus. Colorado is going to beat them nine times out of 10, but seven times out of 10, it's going to be three to two. And that's yeah. just, that's just the reality of the business. So I do like betting the playoff series and finding value there over games, uh, point props for, for NHL. And I'm a big, big, big NFL guy. Uh, just watch, watch the dogs take the points. A lot of the times, look at the under overs, look at, look at the trends of, of those teams and, and follow the under overs. Uh, but everyone falls in love with the, with the big names, the, the Kansas city, like everyone mm-hmm. thinks that Kansas city is like, even though they won the Super Bowls and then they, they've, they've won a ton of them. They've been magical in the regular season. 
they're a shitty team at covering spreads. <laughs> they're always giving 10 to 12 points, and everyone good, just thinks that yeah, they good point. blow everyone out. But the reality is they win by five, they win by six, they win by seven, but they're giving up 10 to 12 points. So uh, don't don't fall for that trick. And like being in Canada, like everyone loves the Leafs. So that, those those lines are skewed because everyone bets the Leafs. It's the biggest market in Canada that has the most people in Canada. And everyone's going to bet Austin Matthews and the Toronto Maple Leafs because you're a fan. So it drives that line up. So yeah. look at the team in Tampa Bay that's like plus 125. And they've won three Stanley Cups, even though they haven't been as good as the Leafs this year. Listen to Barney. Stop laying the points with the Chiefs, damn it. Uh, I like the <laughs> advice. Hey, man, I, I seriously, I got to thank you again for making the time today. The book is unfiltered. Matthew Barnaby, it is great stuff. I told you earlier uh, before we hit record, I'm about halfway through. I'm through the uh, NHL career portion of it. I'm looking forward to finishing it later this afternoon. And the, uh, the I guess, afterlife, the second life of Matthew Barnaby after the NHL career ended. How How is it? Uh, what, what keeps Matthew Barnaby busy other than playing some pickup hockey now and then, uh, you know, spending family time? What, what, what keeps you busy? I'm visiting my kids when I, when I can. I probably see my son more than my daughter. Um, play a lot of golf in the summer. I'm at the cottage a lot in the summer. Uh, obviously, the betting, betting part of it. And then uh, my chauffeur. She keeps me very, very <laughs> busy. So next time I come on, I will, I will have a better studio than – the seat belt being uh no no people, you're all you're all good people would say i use the seat belt when i fought but uh yeah <laughs> light, 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 life's good light, life's very good i'm very fortunate uh seem to be very healthy we'll see what the years uh, have to come with concussions but uh enjoy the rest of the book thanks for having me on and if you ever need me on during the year or when you're done the book let me know Absolutely. Matthew Barnaby, 15-year NHL vet and former Pittsburgh Penguin. The book is unfiltered. Go check it out. Get it on Amazon, all your favorite uh, retailers. Thanks again for the time, man. Really appreciate it. Next time, I'll chirp you a little bit better. Hey, yeah, hey, learn some French next time. <laughs> en français. All right. Thanks, man. Cheers. Great stuff from Matthew Barnaby on, wow, man, all the different angles of his career, how they relate to today's game, how it relates to the Pittsburgh Penguins. Um, you know, that, that's probably the, the biggest takeaway for me from that discussion, above and beyond anything personal about Matthew, is when you ask him the question, and this is a guy who played at the peak of the, I would call it wild, wild west, late 80s, 90s, early 2000s uh, in the NHL, um, or I guess 90s and early 2000s. Um, is that Mike Sullivan is the kind of guy he would want to play for. You know, we do. We get caught up in, uh, and I was guilty of it down the stretch as they missed the playoffs as well. We get caught up in, well, maybe they just need a different voice. Maybe that's it. Well, maybe that's not the problem at all. Uh, maybe Mike Sullivan is just the right guy. And while it feels like his influence in the organization is growing, even if it's only temporarily until they hire a new hockey ops staff, it sounds like he's the kind of guy that players – will go out there and bust their rear ends for. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with why Sidney Crosby, Crosby, pardon me, probably has zero interest in finishing his career anywhere else. Not just Malkin and Latang by his side, uh, he hopes down the stretch towards the end of his career, but maybe playing for Mike Sullivan is also a very large, very important part of that. Uh, thanks again to Matthew Barnaby. Thanks to you. Don't forget to follow, rate, review, uh, all of the episodes of Fifth Avenue Faceoff. Uh, we will do a, a mailbag edition soon. So leave your questions at the Chris Mack on Twitter or chris.mac at odyssey, A U D A C Y dot com. That's also where you find the podcast inside your Odyssey app or wherever you get your podcast for that matter. Leave those ratings and reviews. Really appreciate you listening. And we'll do it again, another edition right around the corner of Fifth Avenue Faceoff. <laughs>